Before we begin, let's step into a store to buy some apples. Let's say we need 24 apples. When we collect them, we get them in two boxes, with one dozen or 12 apples in each box. Here, dozen is a unit of measurement that helps us simplify and state a large quantity, like 12. When scientists were working with elements and compounds, they felt the need to have a unit of measurement to count entities at the microscopic level. Thus, the SI base unit, mole, was introduced. Mole is the amount of substance which contains as many elementary entities as there are in 12 gram of carbon. Elementary entities may be atoms, molecules, ions, electrons or protons. Note that one mole of a substance always contains the same number of entities irrespective of the identity and kind of the substance. The term mole is used to count particles such as atoms, molecules, ions, electrons and protons. Hence, we must indicate the nature of the particle under observation. For example, saying one mole of hydrogen would be incorrect. We need to specify the entity we are referring to. That is, hydrogen atoms or hydrogen molecules. Thus, the correct term would be one mole of hydrogen atoms or one mole of hydrogen molecules. But what is the value of a mole? Let's find out. We know that a carbon-12 atom is used as a base to calculate the atomic mass of elements. Hence, scientists used carbon as the base to determine the value of one mole. They used a mass spectrometer to determine the mass of a carbon-12 atom and found it to be 1.992648 multiplied by 10 raised to minus 23 gram. They then divided 12 gram moles of carbon-12 by the mass of carbon-12 and obtained 6.0221367 multiplied by 10 raised to 23, which is the number of atoms in one mole or 12 gram of carbon. This is the value of one mole and is known as Avogadro's number or Avogadro's constant in the honor of Amedeo Avogadro and is usually represented as Na. Avogadro's number or Avogadro's constant is defined as the number of elementary entities, atoms or molecules or ions in one mole of a substance. Thus, we can say that one mole of water molecules contains 6.022 multiplied by 10 raised to 23 water molecules. Having found the number of moles in a substance, we can determine the mass of a mole, also known as molar mass. Molar mass is the mass of one mole of substance expressed in grams. The molar mass is numerically equivalent to the atomic or molecular or formula mass in U. Let's determine the molar mass of water. We know that water comprises two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. We can obtain the atomic masses of hydrogen and oxygen from the periodic table. The atomic mass of hydrogen is 1.00794 and the atomic mass of oxygen is 15.9994. If we add the atomic masses of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, we get the molar mass of water as 
18.02 gram. We've learnt that molecular mass of a substance can be obtained by adding the atomic masses of all the atoms present in one molecule of the substance. And the molar mass is numerically equivalent to the atomic or molecular or formula mass in U. Thus, we can conclude that the mass of one mole of any substance is equal to its molecular mass. We have seen how to determine the number of entities present in a substance. At times, scientists also require to know the percentage of elements present in a compound. This information helps to determine the purity of the chemical compound under observation. The percentage composition of elements or constituent in a compound is the number of parts by mass of that element or constituent present in 100 parts by molar mass of the compound. Let's look at an example. We know that the molar mass of water is 18.02 grams. Based on this, we can calculate the percentage of hydrogen and oxygen as shown. Thus, the percentage of oxygen and hydrogen in water is 88.79 and 11.18 respectively. Molar mass and percentage composition helps us understand the quantitative data associated with a chemical compound. But how does one arrive at the chemical formula of a compound? In other words, how did scientists obtain the formula H2O? The chemical formula of a compound is derived from two parts, the empirical formula and the molecular formula. The empirical formula is defined as the formula which gives the simplest whole number ratio of the different atoms present in one molecule of the compound. For example, the empirical formula of water is H2O. This indicates that in water, two hydrogen atoms are present for each oxygen atom. Similarly, the empirical formula of glucose is CH2O. This indicates that there is one carbon atom for every two hydrogen and one oxygen atoms. Note that the empirical formula only indicates the atomic ratio of the elements present in one molecule of the compound. Now, let's look at molecular formula. The molecular formula is defined as the formula which gives the actual number of atoms of various elements present in one molecule of a compound. In case of water, the molecular formula is H2O, same as the empirical formula, because one molecule of water contains two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. In case of glucose, the molecular formula is C6. H12O6. This means that one molecule of glucose has six carbon atoms, 12 hydrogen atoms, and six oxygen atoms. The molecular formula of a compound is an integral multiple of the empirical formula. The equation can be illustrated as shown. The value of N can be obtained by Dividing the molecular mass with the empirical formula mass. The empirical formula mass is the sum of the atomic masses of the atoms present in the element. Let's say we have a compound CH2. The empirical formula of the compound will be the sum of the atomic masses of one carbon atom and two hydrogen atoms, which is 14 gram mole. Now, let's say that we know 
the molecular mass of the compound is 28 gram mole. Thus, 28 divided by 14 gives us 2. Then, we multiply 2 by the empirical formula and get C2H4. We've learned how to calculate molar mass, percentage composition, empirical formula and molecular formula. But when do we apply these calculations in chemistry? Let's say we have conducted an experiment and obtained a compound that has 29.11% sodium, 40.51% sulfur and 30.38% oxygen and the molar mass of the compound is 158.1 gram. How can we determine the empirical and molecular formula of this compound? First, we have to convert the mass percent to gram. As we have the values in mass percent, we can consider the value of the sample as 100 gram and then convert the percent values to gram. Next, we have to determine the number of moles in each element. Divide the mass of element in gram with the atomic mass of the element. The atomic masses of various elements can be identified from the periodic table. Therefore, the relative atomic mass of sodium, sulfur and oxygen are 23, 32.1 and 16 respectively. On substituting the values in the equation, we get the number of moles for each element as 1.266 and 1.897. Next, calculate the simplest molar ratio. Divide the moles of various elements present in the compound by the smallest quotient obtained as a result. This gives the simplest molar ratio as 1 is to 1 is to 1.5. If the ratios are not whole numbers, then multiply the number with suitable integer to convert them into whole numbers. In this case, if we multiply all values by 2, we get all ratios as whole numbers. That is, 2 is to 2 is to 3. Write the empirical formula by mentioning the numbers after writing the symbols of respective elements. First, write the element symbols next to each other. Then, insert the obtained numerical value of the simplest whole number ratio at the lower right hand corner of each symbol. This gives the empirical formula of the compound, that is, Na2, S2, O3. Now, Let's see the steps to determine the molecular formula. First, calculate the empirical formula mass. The empirical formula mass can be obtained by adding the atomic masses of all the atoms present in the empirical formula, which is 158.1 gram. Now, divide the molar mass by the empirical formula mass to identify the value of n, which we get as 1. Then, molecular formula of a compound can be determined by multiplying empirical formula of the compound with n. In this case, the molecular formula will be the same as the empirical formula, that is, Na2, S2, O3. We know that chemical reactions can be illustrated through a chemical equation. A chemical equation can be divided into two parts. The reactants appear on the left side of the equation. In this reaction, hydrogen and oxygen are reactants. The products appear on the right side of the equation. In this example, 
Water is the product. We've learned that the law of conservation of mass states that in all chemical reactions, the total mass of the reactants is equal to the total mass of the products. This means that the equation of a chemical reaction should be balanced. Notice that the equation for water is balanced. The number of atoms on the left side is equal to the number of atoms on the right side. A chemical equation in which the number of atoms of each element is equal on the reactant side and the product side is called a balanced chemical equation. Let's look at the steps to balance a chemical equation. Let's say we have to write the balanced equation for the combustion of propane. The first step is to write the chemical formula for the reactants and products. In this case, propane, that is C3H8, reacts with dioxygen, O2, to form carbon dioxide. CO2 and water H2O. Note that there are three carbon atoms, eight hydrogen atoms and two oxygen atoms on the left side, while there is one carbon atom, two hydrogen atoms and three oxygen atoms on the right side. Next, we have to balance the number of atoms of each element one by one. Let's begin with carbon. There are three atoms on the left side and one atom on the right side. So, we will multiply CO2 by 3. This means that three carbon dioxide molecules will give us three carbon atoms. Now, let's work on the hydrogen atoms. There are eight atoms on the left side and two on the right side. So, we can multiply H2O by 4. This means that four molecules of water will give us eight hydrogen atoms. Now, let's look at the oxygen atoms. There are two oxygen atoms on the left and ten on the right side. Three multiplied by two oxygen atoms that is, six oxygen atoms in carbon dioxide and four multiplied by one, that is four oxygen atoms in water. Six plus four gives a total of ten oxygen atoms on the right side. Hence, we will multiply O2 on the left side by five. Finally, Verify that the number of atoms in each element is balanced. In this case, we have equal number of atoms on both sides. Hence, this is a balanced chemical equation. A balanced equation helps determine the quantitative relationship between the reactants and products in terms of number of moles, molecules, atomic masses, and volumes. For example, according to this balanced chemical reaction, one molecule of propane gas reacts with five molecules of dioxygen gas to give three molecules of carbon dioxide and four molecules of water. And one mole of propane gas reacts with five moles of dioxygen gas to give 3 moles of carbon dioxide gas and 4 moles of water. Similarly, 44.09 atomic mass unit of propane gas reacts with 160 atomic mass unit of dioxygen to give 132.03 atomic mass unit of carbon dioxide and 72.06 atomic mass unit of water. And 44.09 gram of propane gas reacts with 160 gram of dioxygen to give 132.03 gram 
of carbon dioxide and 72.06 gram of water and the total mass of the reactants that is 204.9 grams is equal to the total mass of the products which is also 204.9 gram. The calculation of quantitative relationships of the reactants and products in a balanced chemical reaction is known as stoichiometry. The coefficients in a balanced chemical equation are called stoichiometric coefficients. Stoichiometric calculations help understand the mass and mass relationship. This means that if we know the mass of one of the reactants or products, we can determine the mass of the other reactants and products. Similarly, it helps understand mass and volume relationship. That is, if we know the mass or volume of one reactant or product, then we can calculate the mass or volume of the other reactants or products. And if we know the volume of one reactant or product, then we can calculate the volume of the other reactants or products. Most chemical reactions take place in solutions. Hence, we need to understand how to apply stoichiometry to reactions in solutions. For solutions, we need to know the concentration. That is, the number of moles present in a certain volume of solution. We can express the concentration of a solution present in a given volume through four methods. They are mass percent, mole fraction, molarity and molality. Let's look at each method. The mass percent of a solution is determined by dividing the mass of the solute by the mass of the solution and multiplying it by 100. For example, let's say a solution is prepared by adding 4 gram of substance A to 20 gram of water. We need to find the mass percent of the solute. Based on the mass percent formula, we need to divide the mass of A by the mass of the solution. That is, mass of A plus the mass of water. After performing the mathematical calculation, we get the mass percent of A as 16.66. Now, let's look at mole fraction. Mole fraction is the ratio of number of moles of a particular component to the total number of moles of the solution. Mole fraction is a way to express the composition of mixture. For example, if a substance A dissolves in substance B and their number of moles are Na and Nb respectively, then the mole fraction of A will be the number of moles of A divided by the number of moles of solution and the mole fraction of B will be the number of moles of B divided by the number of moles of solution. Let's say we have to find the mole fractions of water and glycerol. When 92 gram glycerol is mixed with 90 gram water, given that the molecular weight of water is 18 gram and the molecular weight of glycerol is 92 gram, To apply the mole fraction formula, we first need to find the number of moles in water and glycerol. The number of moles of water is 5 and the number of moles of glycerol is 1. We then add them to obtain the total number of moles in the solution. From the calculation, we get the total number of moles in the solution as 6. Then, we find the mole fraction 
As per the formula, we get the mole fraction of water as 0.833 and the mole fraction of glycerol as 0.167. Next, let's look at molarity. Molarity is the number of moles of solute in one liter of solution. It is represented as capital M. Let's say we have to find the molarity of a solution formed when water is added to 11 gram calcium chloride to make 100 ml of solution. To find the number of moles of a solute, we need to divide the mass of calcium chloride by the molar mass of calcium chloride and need to convert 100 milliliter solution into liter. By applying the formula for molarity, we get the molarity of the solutions as 1.0 m. Finally, let's look at molality. Molality is defined as the number of moles of a solute present in 1 kilogram of solvent. And it is denoted as lowercase m. Let's say we have to find the molality of a solution of 10 gram sodium hydroxide in 500 gram water. To find the number of moles of solute, we need to divide the mass of sodium hydroxide by the molar mass of sodium hydroxide. We also need to convert 500 gram water into kilogram. Thus, after applying the formula, we get the molality of the solution as 0.50 m. At times, when reactions occur, the reactants are not present in the amount required by the balanced chemical equation. Let's understand this concept through a real-life example. For example, let's say that two slices of bread and one slice of cheese makes one sandwich. Now, if we had a packet of bread with 10 slices and a packet of cheese with 6 slices, how many sandwiches can we make? The answer is 5 sandwiches. In this example, Bread is present in lesser amount and gets fully consumed. And hence, we cannot make any more sandwiches, although one slice of cheese is left. Thus, bread is known as a limiting reagent. As its shortfall prevents us from making any more sandwiches, while cheese is the reactant in excess. Let's look at the steps to find a limiting reagent and reactant in excess in a chemical reaction. Let's understand how to calculate limiting reagents from this example. Assume that we mix 50 kg of nitrogen gas and 10 kg of hydrogen gas to produce ammonia gas. Here, we have to determine the limiting reagent during the production of ammonia. First, we have to write the balanced chemical equation of the reaction. Next, we have to convert the given amount into moles. First, we'll convert the mass of nitrogen into grams and then apply the formula to find the moles, which is 1785.7 Similarly, we'll convert the mass of hydrogen to gram and then apply the formula. We get the moles of hydrogen as 
960.3. From the balanced chemical equation, we can conclude that one mole of nitrogen reacts with three moles of hydrogen. Thus, 1785.7 mole of nitrogen reacts with 5357.1 moles of hydrogen. However, we have 4960.3 moles of hydrogen, not 5357.1 moles. Thus, we can conclude that nitrogen is not the limiting agent. If we test in the reverse manner, that is, 3 moles of hydrogen reacts with 1 mole of nitrogen, we get 1,653.4 moles of nitrogen. As against the 1,785.7 moles of nitrogen. Thus, we can say that nitrogen is the excess reagent while hydrogen is the limiting reagent.